You probably own a word processor, so you think you have everything it takes to turn out a top-notch document. But then you realize in today's global economy, you may have to correspond with someone in France or Japan or Russia. And it dawns on you, how would I turn out a document in a foreign language? Here at the San Francisco Moscow Teleport, for example, they have to communicate on a regular basis in English and Russian. And it takes more than just a word processor to do that. Today, we take a look at foreign language software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kilborn. Gary, I hesitate to show you this toy because I know you're going to want it. <laughs> This is the Wizard computer. You may mm -hmm. have seen this thing made by Sharp. It's kind of pocket computer. This is a ROM card, an eight language foreign dictionary. So I slip this little card into the computer, turn the thing on. Okay, eight language translator. I get to pick up my home languages. Say English we start with. I want to translate into my choice of eight languages. I say Japanese. I go into this general conversation. I say, well, let's find a little sentence I want to translate here. Uh, say the sentence would be, what is this? Mm -hmm. I say, how do you say that in Japanese? It shows it to me in Japanese. If we can't read the kanji characters, I say, okay, how do I say that in English? Kari wa non desu ka. Very good. <laughs> Pretty neat. And I can do this yeah. in eight different languages. This is a relatively simple uh, application. What I'd like to see is a PC program in which I could write a letter in English, press a button and say, I want to see it in French. But I don't have such a program. Why is it so hard to write something like that? Well, as you're aware, that's a classic computing program problem. It was one that was worked on in the 50s for military purposes, yeah. I believe. And uh, the problem, of course, is the context of the sentence is very, very important. Right. What is the classic? Uh, well, there's you know, the great line in which the sentence in English was, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the computer translated that, the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a very good example yeah. of it. When you and I are talking, for example, we're probably talking about the computer chronicles. Uh -huh. So every sentence is in that context. The parsing of a sentence, taking it apart, putting things back together, that's not very difficult. Uh -huh. It's just trying to find that context. What does it mean? Well, Gary, today we're actually going to see a PC program that does translate from English into German. We'll see an online translation service, and we'll see two HyperCard applications that teach you a foreign language. Now, there is a very big mainframe computer translation system, probably the best in the world, called the Logos Machine, and we found one working at the Cullinet Corporation here in San Francisco. The 20th century may justly be remembered as the era of speed, speed of travel and speed of communication. But even today, the opening up of geographic borders has not been followed by a breaching of linguistic borders. If you can't speak the language, you won't be understood. Fortunately, there are signs that the computer might soon be able to help. The Logos Corporation has developed a fully automatic translation system for English, French, and German. The software, running on a mainframe or mini-computer, translates documents one sentence at a time, analyzing the semantic and syntactic relationship of the words. If you look at a word, this word is ambiguous as long as it's not defined by a context. So if you have a word like, say, green, that can be the color green, it can be the golf pudding green, it can be a green engineer, somebody who's inexperienced. We have to figure out in the translation process what the word is all about. The Logos translator is currently in use by Cullinet software to translate English manuals into German and French. Cullinet sends the machine translation to Europe, where it is checked and refined at the receiving end. While Logos has its own base of semantic rules, the user can tailor the program to suit a particular subject or field. Logos is most successful at translating straightforward text. It's not meant for poets and novelists. But as day-to-day -day business becomes more international, the company expects a growing need for effective and fast translation. An example would be Europe, 1992, where over the next few years, the last tariff barriers are to be removed where a truly common market is to evolve. Here we see an emerging market for 
information only. Joining us in the studio now is Axel Bayreuther, President of International Computer Products. And next to Axel is Dr. Marty Goodman, Database Manager with Delphi. Gary. Axel, you're, you have a program that translates English to German, is that correct? Right. Okay, now, yes. what is the purpose of this? For learning or to write letters to your friends in Germany? <laughs> what, it, it does actually both. Uh, uh -huh. It is meant to be a program to teach a language. Okay. And we also have it in Spanish. But it does it by means of translation. In other words, you study the syntax of the sentence which was translated from English. Any sentence that you input will be translated to a certain degree uh, if the vocabulary, if the word is known to the vocabulary of the computer, of course. Okay. To show now, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Okay, um, we are now in the menu, so we hit the T key twice and we enter, let's say, I want to learn the German language. Correct me if I misspelled You're fine. it. No? With the help, I've got a space missing there. With oh the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The help of my computer. No, okay. that's a fairly. Whoa, that was yeah. fast. Uh, it goes very fast, and uh, Did you read it, it to us shows in German? now the correct translation. Ich möchte die deutsche Sprache mit der Hilfe von meinem Computer lernen. Mm -hmm. uh, the verb is in this sentence at the end. And also, I don't want to go too much into details, but von meinem computer is correct because it's third case is dative in German, which uh -huh. is very important. Uh -huh. And now we come to, I go back to the translation a little bit later. We come okay. to the grammatical part. I talked about noun declension. Now, in grammar, first you talk about verb conjugation. So let's go into verb conjugation and take the verb, um, um, I hit the wrong key. And do it again, verb conjugation. To go. It shows you mm -hmm. the present, the past, present perfect, and future tense in singular and plural, which is very important, especially for irregular verbs like this one to go. Right. Noun declension the same. You have the dog. In English, we only have possessive and objective case. And here we have four cases, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another part of the program, of course, is the um, a dictionary. You can use it as a dictionary. Let's select J. It mm -hmm. gives you IJ sections combined, the I's, the idea. And uh, numbers is very interesting, because numbers are compound numbers in German. Uh, let's take a number like um, 777,777. <laughs> it's always fascinating. Whoa. That you, uh, <laughs> that's that one is German. That's number in German. 777,777. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's go back to the uh, uh, main program and uh, play a little bit more around with the translation. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume I want to write a letter, as you mentioned. Okay. Gary mentioned it. Uh, dear Gary, now any proper noun uh, or word like lieber Gary, of course Gary will not be translated. I show that again in the next uh, mm -hmm. example. We can save this in a special text file, which will later can be edited with a word processor. OK, let's go back to translation. Uh, the weather in San Francisco is beautiful. It was today, I must say. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. As you see, it goes very fast. Das Wetter in San Francisco ist schön. We save it again and we start composing our letter. So you're building up okay. all these pieces of the letter yes. and then you can bring them together. At the end, when you come, I'll show you in a second okay. when we come to the end. Now let's uh, show one more feature. In German, it is uh, very important that uh, an example like the word you in English can be polite form right. uh, or a friendly okay. form or plural form. Let me show you, for example, um, she loves your cat. Mm -hmm. Sie liebt deine Katze, I would say to a friend of mine, but to you as a stranger, I mean we're now friends, but as a stranger <laughs> in the beginning, I have to say, sie liebt ihre Katze. Uh -huh. While if I address myself to you three as the owner of the cat, I have to, I have to say, sie liebt eure Katze. Uh -huh. And when we come to the end, now we save that again. When we come to the end, it asks you, Save translated test, it shows you here. Mm -hmm. If you want to save it, you can dump it in an ASCII mm -hmm. file and 
edit it with the word processor, processor so that you can write a letter with it. We Oxel, don't want to save it, so I just put it. Terrific. If you can slide the keyboard, Oxel, over to sure. Marty for a second while she's going to sign Axel, on tell, the Delphi. Tell us a little bit about the technology behind this. What is, what, what is, what is the process that you're going through? Well, it is a uh, it employs artificial intelligence, of course, because it um, the computer first looks in the vocabulary, in the uh, resident vocabulary. At the moment, we have about 10,000 words in there. Mm -hmm puts together the sentence, then it parses over the sentence several times to uh, find the correct main verb in its clause and so on. So it puts together the sentence correctly in the other language. I see. And as you can see, it goes... Now, does it make fast. mistakes? Does it make what? <laughs> mistakes? <laughs> does it make mistakes? <laughs> of course it makes mistakes. I didn't have the time to show you. For example, if you put in a word like, my uncle is a boo-boo, which I usually do at shows, of course the computer doesn't know how to translate boo-boo. <laughs> so what the computer does, my program does, it puts the word boo-boo within brackets, but uh, it translates the rest okay, of the Okay, since I couldn't figure this one out. Yes, okay. so you can, at the end, when you use your word processor, you can always look it up in the dictionary, okay. find out what yeah. boo boo is, and then you say, "My uncle is ein whatever boo boo is." You know. <laughs> okay, Marty, you're online with Delphi now, Just and explain what you're going to uh, show us here. WordNet is a translation service on Delphi run by Lee Chadane, through which he can coordinate over 400 human translators. So this is a translation service using the computer to access real human being translators. The computer and the telecommunications are merely the glue between people. Mm -hmm. Show us how you would use it. Well, I'm about ready to send a Spanish letter, and I've requested that WordNet translate it into English mm -hmm. and deliver it through Delphi in this case. Okay, so say I just received the letter in Spanish in my business, I can't understand it, I want Delphi to translate it for me. And deliver it. And deliver it, okay, so you're gonna, you just, you're uploading that letter, which we see right now. Okay, and what, tell us what the next step is once this is uh, uploaded to Delphi. Well, this letter will be sent by the WordNet service to an appropriate translator. Uh -huh. And the translation will be performed, and then it will be once again electronically okay. sent via Delphi to the person you wish to okay. receive it. Okay, could you show us then how you would now retrieve the translated version of that letter? And sort of tell us what you're doing as you do it there, if you can, Marty. Well, first I'm going to leave the WordNet service. Okay. Am I in your way? No, no, that's no. fine. And okay. um, so then I will be going to the mail service on Delphi. Okay, so you really the use WordNet right now, and you're going to go into your mailbox to see if the translated letter has come back to you? That is correct. Okay. Axel, while he's working on that, let's talk about uh, your program. How much does it cost to, to buy that Learn German? Uh, under $100. Uh, learn Spanish or Learn German. We have those two programs. And it runs on the PC? It runs on the PC, uh -huh. yes. Lowest configuration, starting from 256K. Okay. And where are you now, Marty? I've gone to my mailbox, and the translation of that Spanish text would normally arrive a day or so later, but okay. in this case, we happen to have an example of how that would look when it arrived. Uh -huh. And um, So I see Spanish translation, is that what you're looking for there? Oh, that should be it. Okay. And theoretically, right, there's the letter in English. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Marty, what would it cost then for translation normally? Say it's a letter like this. This sort of translation mm -hmm. would run seventeen dollars for a hundred words. If it were a highly technical translation, the fee might be higher. Mm -hmm. And normally, how long would it take? We've we've obviously collapsed this and, and, and done this ahead of time for our demonstration purposes. But normally, if I sent up a letter today, when would I get that translation back? You could easily have it done in a matter of a couple of days. There uh -huh. are situations in which you could request faster service. You would pay for it, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Now, usually when we talk about foreign language software, uh, as we saw in the German case, we're going from English to some other language. In fact, there are many non-English speaking people who are using computers to learn English. Wendy Woods has a report. Art. Larry Statton, through a company called Linguatech, teaches accent improvement skills to those who are foreign born. While much of the work takes place in the classroom, the rest is on a computer. Using software that Larry wrote called Speakware, students can see and practice the way English sounds are made. And drills provide inexhaustible playback of what are called minimal pairs, English words with subtle pronunciation differences. Nice. Nice. 
the theory is, the, the idea is, if you can hear the difference, you can make the difference. The software drills them on hearing the difference. And uh, once they hear the difference, then by using the animated mouth positions and so forth, they can learn to make the difference. Because this is computer software and not audio tape, the sounds in this program, made with Mac Recorder from Farallon, can be replayed instantly. And finally, Larry uses Mac Recorder itself to show a student a visual representation of their own speech. With cut and paste functions, the speech can be manipulated and corrected. There's a reason why the Macintosh and not the PC is running Speakware, Apple's HyperCard. As Larry says, he was more interested in the product than the process, and Apple had the right tools to help him put together the product that he needed. In San Ramon, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us in the studio now is Bob Sullivan. Bob is president of Anony Software, and next to Bob is Dr. Martin Rice, president of Hyperglot. Uh, Martin, you, you both, both you and Bob have uh, computer programs that teach foreign languages. Uh, what makes a computer system better than, say, you know, traditional techniques like books and tapes and so forth? Well, there are a lot of reasons, certainly as far as tapes go, and we're talking about sound. Uh, tapes are difficult. You have to go back and forth and back and forth, and to hear the same sound over, it takes a lot of time. With the computer, you can just keep clicking on it over and over, hear it as many times as you want. Uh, in addition to that, the graphics that we have available to us uh, on the computer make uh, I, I make it a lot more exciting mm -hmm. for the uh, students. And just the idea that it's a computer rather than a traditional method seems to have a lot of appeal for this the students. This brings the interest level up. In right. Yeah, exactly. Bob, mm -hmm. what's, a, what's the target audience for this? Who uses it? Well, for my particular application, it, uh, it varies from high school through college through adult education. Uh, the stack is set up so that uh, both beginning and advanced students would benefit from, from using it. Okay, now both of your, both of your programs are, are going to be in HyperCard, right? That, that's yeah. right. Okay. Uh, Can uh, we take a look and see okay, what your Bob, program your program is. teaches Japanese. Uh, that's right. Show us uh, how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, let me first say Japanese has three character sets, uh, hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Uh, my particular applications emphasize the hiragana and katakana portions of the language. And why, why is that? Uh, it's a finite set of characters. Each contains about 50. Uh, kanji, on the other hand, uh, consists of several thousand. Uh, we will be releasing the first of, of uh, many kanji packages in a few months. Okay. Uh, Show us how it works. Well, the initial navigation screen is set up. The icons at the top of the screen basically get you back into the Macintosh or into the HyperCard home stack. The icons at the bottom and the words over here are used to study the Japanese language. The, we recommend that for beginning students, they use a syllabary or the information contained by clicking this question mark here. We provide uh, six pages of information which get into the basic phonetic structure of Japanese. If one, for example, uh, uh, combines the consonants here with the vowels here, you get the, the sound of, of that mm -hmm. particular character. I can show that better by going to the syllabary. Again, we have an expanded view of the syllabary. If, if I click this little box here and put an X in, I can come up here and get the actual ka, phonetic, uh, pronunciation ni, ku, of that column. Ke, ko, ka, ku, kyo. I can also practice that myself by taking the X out, coming up and clicking it again, and then going through a ka, ki, ku, ke, ko uh, exercise. More information can be obtained for, for a particular character by clicking it one can actually show the stroke order mm -hmm. by clicking this button here. And in Japanese, stroke order is important. You can also click this icon here and, and hear the particular sound. De, de. Uh -huh. For more advanced students, we recommend uh, using the reading and writing exercises. Reading exercises are set up so that you can uh, study verbs, nouns, mm -hmm. adjectives, or other words that begin with A through O and so forth and so on. For example, verbs, we have here the Japanese uh, hiragana characters. By clicking that field, we get the romaji, or the, the phonetic pronunciation, and then finally mm -hmm. the English translation. Uh, the writing exercises are set up so that, uh, again, the, the, the syllabary is presented. However, the consonants and vowels are missing. By clicking English here, we get an English word. We can come in here now and click each character and create what would appear to be the Japanese word, we can check it by clicking hiragana, uh -huh. and this will give us the correct pronunciation. That's great. Bob, can I ask you to slide the keyboard over to Martin so we can get his Russian program up? And while you're doing that, 
Bob, is this designed to be used just by a student alone with a computer or to be supplemented by a human teacher? Actually, it should be used alone. I mean, it's, uh, it, I would recommend that students also get formal instruction, but the program is structured that uh, anyone basically could just bring it up and start. So I could studying. buy this myself, go home and really study oh, the Japanese with yeah. this. Okay, your program teaches Russian, Martin, and what approach do you take here? Well, to begin with, of course, we have the Cyrillic alphabet, so that's the first obstacle to anybody who's learning mm -hmm. Russian. And uh, this set of three diskettes uh, teaches people how to recognize the alphabet, how to understand it, how to put the sounds together and to be able to read uh, words. It doesn't uh, purport to teach them the language, right? Okay. It's just the, the, the introduction. Right. Um, so we would start, of course, with the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And then when they, they get to this screen, they can, for example, click right here and hear a native speaker say all of the sounds uh -huh. of the alphabet like this. And then they can practice themselves. Uh, this is what I was saying before about not having to rewind Bwe. that sound B uh, till they, they can just click it Bwe. and hear it and Bwe. click it and hear it until mm -hmm. they don't need it anymore. They can cover the English, then look at these strange uh, symbols uh -huh. and decide whether they know them. Je. And if they know it, fine. Yeah. Um, after they've learned these raw sounds, then they can go into more depth. So for example, um, we have a, uh, a phenomenon that uh, requires you to palatalize certain sounds uh, in Russian. So that's done, one of the ways that's done is by writing the soft sign. If you have a soft sign, the consonant that comes before it is palatalized. But you have to hear the difference. So Brat. that's a uh, palatalized T. Brat and that's a non-palatalized uh -huh. T, for example, and they can go over that and over that. It's a subtle sound difference until they, uh, until they learn it. Uh, there's a lot more about palatalization than you can just see on the screen here, and when you're ready for it, you can go down and you can look at the notes where you can get into a much more mm -hmm. uh, in-depth uh, discussion of, uh, of palatalization when you're ready for it. And that's one of the nice things about it. You don't have to deal with it until you're uh, mm -hmm. ready for it. And then finally, of course, they can uh, start practicing their reading. We begin with cognates. These Russian words are really identical to the English. And if you know that, it may, they're sort of like hints to figure yeah. out what they, what they are. Uh, so for example, Atom, Mama, Act, Doctor. Uh -huh. They're al almost the same. And that's where we begin. And there, there are a lot of words like that. When they've finished with this, of course, they can then go on to uh, the next step in, an, in another stack, and uh, that'll go into more depth, start teaching grammar, a little bit of grammar, just to give them an introduction and a feel for what uh, Russian yeah. grammar is like. How deep do these programs go? You said it doesn't really teach you the Russian language, but how much can you learn using this, this hypercard stuff? Well, you have to use this in, in conjunction with other things. This will, uh, we use this, for example, where, where I teach uh, during the first two weeks of the first semester of Russian. But then we have uh, noun drills, verb drills, vocabulary drills. Um, so if you use all of them, uh, you can go pretty deeply into the study of uh, Russian. Martin, just give me some, a little bit of background in terms of uh, uh, the hypercard. Has, has that been a real benefit to you in developing this? Oh, true tremendous benefit in development time. Um, I did a Russian verb exercise in Pascal. It took me a couple of months. I did the same thing in HyperCard. It took me two weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Bob, what about you? Oh, yeah. What, what HyperCard has done, it's really facilitated uh, access to the Macintosh for non-programmers mm -hmm. uh, to do a lot of creative things. Uh, are these products on the market now, actually? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, my Japanese stack, uh, the two programs, Hiragana and Katakana, retail for $45. And how about the Russian program, Martin? Uh, we have four Russian products that uh, range from $19.95 to $49.95. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Impressive and at a good price. <laughs> that's our look at foreign language software. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. access file this week, it looks like you may be able to buy the next computer at Businessland. Following Compaq's decision to pull its PCs from Businessland, the competition has been hot and heavy among PC vendors who want to take over that shelf space. Analysts predict a slot at Businessland's retail stores could mean $100 million in annual sales. And now Next says it's going after the business and technical markets, not just the education market, and planning to sell its computers in the retail chain. 
Other rumored contenders for business land shelf space are Hewlett Packard, Zenith, AST, AT&T, and NEC. Next Computers also reportedly has struck deals with major software developers to write business packages for the Unix-based Next Machine. Lotus has finally confirmed that there will be two new versions of 123 coming out this summer. We've all heard about version 3.0, but now Lotus says there will be a low-end version called 2.2, aimed at users with limited memory and speed. Version 3.0 requires at least a 286 machine and a megabyte of memory. Many of the new features of the 123 upgrade will still be included in release 2.2. The cost of an upgrade for either version will be $150. Government Computer News just completed a survey of government computer workers to find out which was their favorite word processor. And the easy winner was WordPerfect. While WordStar placed second in number of users, OfficeWriter finished second in high marks for its features. Next in order were Microsoft Word, Volkswriter, and Professional Write. Another erasable optical drive is about to hit the market. Matsushita will be selling a new 3.5-inch drive with a 280-megabyte capacity. Average access time is 42 milliseconds. No word yet on price or availability. If you're wondering where is the new IBM version of a laptop, it looks like Big Blue is waiting to come out with the world's first color laptop. IBM says it's partners with Toshiba in developing a new color flat-screen display that can handle 16 colors. The screen's 400,000 elements are rewritten 60 times a second for smooth motion. No word yet on when the laptop might hit the market. The hot high-tech toy of last year, as if you didn't know, was the fax machine. Sales soared 194 percent. If you're interested in a fax board for your PC, Quadrum now says it's offering a 30-day free trial for its JT fax card. The rumors are out again about the demise of the good old Apple II. Apple is coming out with a new upgrade of the 2GS, but insiders say that will be the end of the line. There is very little new software being rewritten for the Apple II, and while sales of the two earned $130 million for Apple, last year. That was peanuts compared to the $800 million in sales four years ago. Apple denies the rumors. Finally, Air Canada is experimenting with a nice in-flight feature, complimentary laptop computers. The Canadian airline has put two Toshiba 1200s on board for use by passengers. The laptops come complete with WordPerfect and Lotus 123 and a complimentary disc for taking home your work. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.